Welcome to Sweden's National Museum of Science and Technology for the inauguration of the 2022 World Environment Day. This is being broadcast on UN Web TV and on all the UN channels. My name is Thomas Lindblom, and we will open this inauguration by listening to, to some music from Sago Selly. so much Saga Sally for um, opening this inauguration in such a lovely way. I would now like to give the floor to Sweden's Minister for Climate and the Environment, Ms. Annika Strandhell. Thank you uh, very much and uh, ladies and gentlemen, Executive Director Inger Andersson from, from UNE. The World Environment Day has come home to Sweden. Uh, in 1972, uh, the <coughs> then Swedish Prime Minister, Olaf Palme, told the world, there is no individual future, neither for human beings nor for nations. Our future is common. We must shape it together and we must shape it together. 
1972 was a turning point in history on how we human beings view our environment and our planet. 2022 must also be a turning point. We must show that we hear the call from science and from the young generation. We must learn the lessons of the past and apply our efforts in the present in order to secure a sustainable future for all. I'm so particularly pleased that we are here in uh, the Zero City exhibition at the National Museum of Science and Technology. This exhibition challenges us to create a city where fossil-fueled cars have disappeared and where everything people need is in within easy reach. We all know that the challenges of urbanization, such as air pollution and water scarcity, are truly global. And I find it truly inspiring to see all these examples of how we can plan the climate-friendly and livable cities of the future. But the World Environment Day uh, that we celebrate today is one day every year that millions of people all over the world join the United Nations Environment Programme in celebrating our environment and engaging into protecting our planet, the only planet that we have. The host of the 2022 World in My Environment Day, it is wonderful to see all the activities that are being organized today all over Sweden, from seminars on solar panels and electric cars in Kalix in the north, to a clothes swap in Usta in the far so south. All these events showcase different aspects of the theme of this year's World and My Environment Day. Only one Earth, living sustainably in harmony with nature. They also remind all of us that our future is common and we all need to pull together. No action is too small to make a difference. Before I leave the floor to uh, UNEP's executive director, Inger Andersson, I would like to thank the National Museum of Science and Technology for letting us hold the opening of the 2022 World Environment Day in their topical exhibition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, could I invite Ms. Inger Andersen, uh, Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme, to take the floor, please. Thank you so much, Thomas. And to you, Annika, Minister Stranhal, um, I cannot thank you enough. And through you, the government and the people of Sweden. But most of all, let me thank the young people who are present here today. You are really the guest of honour. And to everyone who is listening in and tuning in across the world, Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. World Environment Day is truly a celebration. And some of us may wonder, well, do we really have things to celebrate? But it is a celebration of the wonders of the natural world. It is a celebration of the activists who are working to keep our world healthy and strong. It's not always easy to celebrate at this time, we recognize, because we do look at a future dominated by that triple planetary crisis, the crisis of climate change, for example. A child born in 2020 will likely face seven times more heat waves than a child born in the 1960s. The crisis of nature and biodiversity loss when I, as a young girl, played in the woods, I could hear birdsong and I saw insects. But the crisis today is that we have lost 600 million birds in Europe alone. And the crisis of pollution and waste, more than 800 million children have led concentration in their blood levels because they have been exposed to, to, to lead. The triple planetary crisis is accelerating, and why? Well, because we consume 1.7 planets a year. We have only one Earth, so we have to accept that we're not doing enough to protect it. And so I stand before you here in Stockholm, where in 1972, on the 5th of June, the Stockholm Conference for the Human Environment opened up. 
50 years ago. I stand before you here in Stockholm, plus 50, where world leaders just yesterday closed, no, the day before yesterday, I'm in a time warp here, <laughs> where world leaders closed the meeting after two days of deliberations and showed a degree of new commitments to fix our mistakes. I stand before you because we have to do better. We know what to do. The science has told us we have to end fossil fuels. We have to restore nature to its full glory. We have to transform our food systems. We have to make our cities green. We have to make them livable and low no carbon. And this is a task that we see here in Sweden is really well underway from Kiruna to Malmö, from Stockholm to Göteborg. And we can do this as one people on this one earth. The world does not belong to a government. The world does not belong to politicians, I'm sorry. The world does not belong to businesses. The world belongs to all of us. And most of all, the world belongs to young people. We together shape the world. We together have done to the world what it tells us that we have done. And so now we must consider our current and future choices. As we have and know very clearly, our societies and economies have put us on a pathway that is linear. We take out of the belly of the earth, we make something of it, and when we're done with it, we discard it as garbage. So we have to shift from that linear economy into a circular economy where everything is used and repurposed and used and repurposed in perpetuity to an economy that values nature, an economy that values and, and uh, places value not on its destruction but on its protection. And we have choices, each one of us, about what we do. We can choose how we take our holidays. We can choose how we buy our clothes. Do we buy fast fashion or not? Do we consume gadgets and throw them away when the next one comes on the market? How do we get our protein from meat-rich diets or from a mixed healthy diet? How do we drive? How do we move? What do we buy? What's our footprint? It is that consumption in which we are all participants that is driving that triple planetary crisis. Now, I am not putting blame on the consumers. I'm saying that we together need to influence governments to shift to circularity, shift so that we can tackle the climate crisis, so that we can tackle the nature crisis and indeed the pollution and waste crisis. So young people here, I ask you to use your voices, to roar, to be loud, to be engaged, to have, to make sure that the democratic values are not eroded, to make sure that that civic space you protect it and don't let it close in on you wherever you are in the world, to hold leaders who make promises to account when you go and vote and use that vote because that vote matters and protect the demands, uh, demand the environmental rights, protect environmental defenders, and battle disinformation and non-facts that are all out there, this misinformation with science and facts, quote unquote. And also, live your lives well, dance, be happy, and understand that in boldness and courage comes happiness. No one is asking you to limit your dreams or your ambitions, but know that success and happiness is not measured in accumulations of things, but measures in accumulation of happiness and experiences. Consumerism and overconsumption is what is killing our planet. So take personal responsibility, choose low emission transport, choose sustainable diets, choose green energy, choose second hand and choose therefore a better future and know that others have also the same dreams and ambitions and every right to those dreams and ambitions as you have and they're just as valid so africa accounts for only a few percent of greenhouse gas emissions but is the continent hardest hit by climate change is it fair to ask 
that opportunities should be limited to by where you come from? Of course not. Every young person understands that. So I ask you also to show solidarity, to make sure that countries from the wealthy governments live up to their commitment to deliver the financial pledge promised in 2009 that by 2020 there shall be 100 billion on the table every year for climate finance. We are not there yet, we're inching towards it. It needs to happen. Work towards a world where geography doesn't matter. We can use the environment to unify in a time when many of us seem to have forgotten that we're all in this together. And indeed, Minister quoted Olaf Palme, who spoke to that uh, 50 years ago. We can let the concept of one Earth lead us to the concept of one humanity. Because this is what we are, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual preference, are all in the end just such small variances on the theme of the human beauty. And so we're different, but we are very much the same. We must show tolerance, wisdom, and understanding to protect the earth, our only home, so that we can live together as one, one humanity, because we really do have only one earth. Thank you. Thank you so much. In addition to our two speakers, I would like to welcome uh, three young people for a conversation with the minister and the executive director. Um, Ferdinand Cueva from Colombia, um, Luisa Andersson and Sonia Berge, both from Sweden. Please. I can start. Yes. Mm. Hello, my name is Lisa Andersson, and I got a question for both of you, if that's fine. Um, is it desirable and possible to find cooperation between schools and society to have an ongoing dialogue about topics relating to the SDGs uh, or the global goals? Thank you so much for, for an excellent question. And the answer is uh, definitely yes. This is exactly what we need to do and what we need to increase. Uh, just like Inger said in, uh, in her opening speech, uh, we need to hear the voices of the young. Uh, this week we had this big UN conference here, uh, Stockholm Plus 50, uh, on the environment. And we really tried to, during this conference, to organize in a substantial and meaningful way uh, dialogue between uh, companies and government representatives and uh, representatives from the young uh, that were, has been chosen from all over the world uh, after the Glasgow conference last year. And they have been working as a youth task force during the whole year and prepared themselves with recommendations for the politicians and for the companies. Uh, but as, as you say, we need to organize even more of that in a more structural, well, uh, structural way and also make sure that the young voices are heard into the polit political decision making. Uh, Inger. Maybe I'll just pick up your question and I'm so happy that you ask it because I actually don't think we're doing enough yet in terms of the curriculum in schools. You know, the curriculum, and I'm talking globally, I don't know about the Swedish specifically, but mm. you know, we, we can't think of it as a little module and a little, little add-on in terms of understanding environmental engagements, right? Uh, curriculum about environmental management, sustainability, and all of that should really be something that is completely integrated into everything. Yeah. From learning your ABCs, you can do lots <laughs> of examples about environment, to engineering in schools. In, in many universities, we still see that um, the engineering schools, the city planners, etc. They're learning all the hard, the hard infrastructure. They're learning about the concrete and the steel and the glass and the, uh, you know, that kind of design. When we know that we need to have permeable roads wh where, where the groundwaters can seep in, when we understand that we need to think about using nature as a buffer. So there's a lot that we need to do. 
And it, you can hear the young people <laughs> down here <laughs> having a good time. And, and when we in UNEP have recognized that we need to l do a lift, part of what we were so happy about mm -hmm. in the Stockholm conference was that there was a youth assembly. There was also a march in central Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And I went there to listen and to hear the voices of the young. And many people are angry and they're frustrated. And I accept and understand, which is why we need to move much faster. Within UNEP, we've tried to do many things to make our information, because we're a science-based organization that puts the science out there. Um, we've tried to make it more understandable, the global environmental outlook. We did one that was done by young people in a, in a more accessible, because it's quite dense science, so more accessible form. We ran Earth School, which was for little kids, every day between um, Earth Day and World Environment Day to do little experiments every day, and, and millions of kids participated. But what we are calling for, that ministries of education across the world really integrate this in their curricula. Yes, thank you so much for very interesting answers. Thank you. Okay, I want to come in second. Uh, I come from Colombia, which is a country where a lot of climate activists have been murdered. And uh, young people want to influence find better ways to influence climate mm. and sustainability. So my question is, how can school youth be given greater opportunities influencing climate and sustainability? Thank you very much. Well, so I think it all begins in the household. So have a conversations with your mom and dad mm. about plastic bags, plastic bottles, hmm. what we buy, how we cook, what we waste. It also begins with having a respectful conversation with the teachers, asking whether, even if it's not in the syllabus, as I discussed before, whether we can have some special projects that can focus on environment. This is as we are growing up. And as we get older, I think we begin to make choices in our lives. We choose the, what we want to study, the line that we wish to study, and there's no right or wrong, right? But if we're studying the arts, maybe we want to use the art and use the, the beauty of planet Earth to express some of the things that we know in our art or with the beautiful music that we heard there. It evokes an inner emotion. If we choose to study engineering, make sure we understand how we integrate nature into our designs. And if we choose and we finish with our studies and we move into a career, make sure if you have a choice between working for a fossil producing company or in a bank that has heavy investment in fossil mm. industry or not, I know what I would choose. You can, you can enter a big corporate and try to change it from within, and that's a wonderful thing. You can also do a startup with and be you know, your own change. You can join grassroots organizations. You can be active in your church or your mosque or your synagogue. You can be active in your community. Each of these are a way of impacting change. Young people have choices. I know that because I know many people whose children will come and tell them, don't let the water exactly. run when you do this. Make, no, you can't water the garden because this is not a good thing. And no, you should not buy this, this, and this because it has these uh, additives and chemicals in it. Kids educate their parents as well as parents educating their kids. Yeah, and especially I would say just on this issue, it's so evident. Uh, if you look at the, the Swedish example and look at the Swedish youth, if you look at uh, young people in the ages between 16 and 34, and those who are going to vote for the first time, you can see that if you look at an older group, they are more traditional. They are talking about healthcare and schools and like the most important issues or defense. If you look at this young group, climate and environment is overarching as the most important issue. And you are already, uh, I would say, uh, changing the course of the future with your choices. We can also see that young people in Sweden, to a much higher degree, uh, think about circularity. 
when it comes to clothes, for example. It's quite uh, a difference. Uh, so, of course, every choice you make from wherever you are, you, you have a possibility to, to give a message. Uh, and I think that the young, ge young generation are trying to do that today on a broad front uh, to those companies and politicians who are in power today. So, uh, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, uh, hello, uh, my name is Sonja Berge and uh, I come from Sweden. So, um, uh, but, um, it is easy uh, to feel worried about the future and to get the feeling that the world leaders are not taking the issue of either climate or peace uh, seriously enough. Um, as for COVID, uh, we saw that it was possible to make adjustments and shut down super fast. Uh, but when it comes to climate, that does not really happen. Um, but how can you support young people to have a more positive view of the future um, and have a belief in democracy and the world leaders? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely so, that, uh, that you are right. And if, uh, if you look at COVID, it also showed very much that the world very fast could really make a great transition. Uh, and from a Swedish point of view, uh, we also put a lot of money on the table to sustain companies and sustain society through the, the pandemic. And that is one thing that has been worrying with, with the climate crisis, that it's a climate crisis that has, I mean, it has moved more slowly and the reactions has not been so, so fast or so acute as during the pandemic, but at the same time, it shows that we really can uh, move fast if we, if we really need to. At the same time, I mean, we have positive uh, examples as well in history. You know, when we took uh, really charge of the ozone layer issues uh, and really turned that development around or uh, banned, um, how do you say, uh, petrol, lead, lead uh, infused petrol, for example, as another good example that really also are examples of when we have been really successful coming together as nations and taking steps forward. So uh, from, from my point of view and the Swedish government's point of view, also now when we see technology leaps uh, with new green technology, I mean, there are really, and this exhibition that we saw together today, there are really so much wonderful possibility that lies in the green transition if we take action. It's a greater future for our children, for the planet, uh, for ourselves, and for biodiversity and the future. So uh, we just have to do it. We know the science, as <laughs> Inger usually says. And just to pick up from what Minister says, look, I mean, I understand that anxiety and that concern because the numbers don't lie. This is what the science says. Yeah. There is, we do have a problem in that from knowing the science to taking the action takes too long. <laughs> it was in 1924 that the world discovered that lead was highly toxic to humans. Yeah. It was in the 1990s that UNEP mounted this huge campaign to get lead out of petrol. And it was in August of 2021 that the last liter at the last pump in the last country got pumped into the last country in the last car with leaded petrol. So from 1924 mm. to 2021, nearly 100 years. We don't have 100 years in climate, in fact. No. And so <laughs> the thing is that we need to understand what the science tells us and make that very understandable and fast. There is no doubt anymore about climate, no. which is why the activism that you have, the activism that you are seeing amongst young people across the world, and you are engaged with Burkina Faso and have visited, and so you will know that there is an engagement across the world from different societies. And what is so powerful is to see that. And I'll mention that whilst, yes, we had this green, this stimulus that happened 
during COVID. Uh, $13 trillion that the northern wealthy governments gave to themselves to stimulate the economy. That was good, but it was not good enough. Globally speaking, we didn't use that green conditionality exactly. to allow for that shift. But now there were also countries that did amazing things. For example, Senegal, a, a not a wealthy country, they reduced the import duty uh, to create jobs during COVID, during lockdown, during really difficult things to import duty on component parts to renewable so that the renewable sector could get a kick. So, and I could tell you a hundred examples <laughs> of that. So there are some really wonderful <coughs> things where we see new technology being embraced. Rwanda, which is next door to where I live in Nairobi, they have actually really enabled that e-mobility, uh, electric mobility is happening. This is not four-wheel cars, this is two-wheelers. Um, and three-wheelers, these are more affordable in a poor country, but we're seeing that shift. So governments have some <coughs> gears that they can pull and things will open up, which is why it comes back to speaking out, using your vote, because it really matters, yeah. and, and making sure, and I say, and I'm in the presence of a politician, <laughs> it is not a left or right issue, it is an intergenerational justice Absolutely. issue. Uh, and so you seek governments made up of different constellations that are leaning in on this issue. So don't waste that, that precious vote that you have and don't lose your voice. Make sure it is heard. <coughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have another uh, question for you both. Um, uh, and that is, um, one of um, the 10 points decided by Stockholm Plus 50 is to strengthen inclusion of for example, young people and people in the work for sustainability. Um, and this, and uh, this sounds really good. Um, uh, the different activities of the occasion Future Voices uh, has given us a platform when we can actually meet politicians, uh, the <coughs> decision makers, um, and adults who work with sustainability in different ways. Um, but what is uh, the next step? Um, how will you go from theory to action? Well, to so first of all, I was really happy that the text highlights this, speaks to the necessity of having all these voices. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, speaks about modern, networked, inclusive multilateralism. It, yesterday's multilateralism, where it was just states that sat around the around the table is not good enough anymore. We need to have all these voices from trade unions to employers to science to youth to faith groups to community activists and so on. How to make that happen? Well, first of all, in United Nations Environment Program, for which I have the privilege of, of leading, what we have seen our young people do is organize a youth assembly before our assembly and come with very specific demands. They did so too for Stockholm Plus 50. And I'm very proud to see that most of the, well, if not all, I have said, uh, they, they've written their demands and these are then reflected and mm -hmm. highlighted. And I don't know if you were in the hall yesterday, but when that was read out, I think yeah. it was by you, the young people sort of erupted yeah. because they were fairly happy that to see for the first time the full paragraph on their demands. It's not enough, and we're not where we want to be. In the letters, when I invite ministers to conferences, negotiations, I always put, please be mindful that you should have young people in your delegation and that you should <coughs> consider gender equity in your delegation. It's not the case now. We have older people and largely a male delegation in most of the government delegations coming to our, our uh, conferences and, and, and negotiations. And there is a difference when young people are inside. And then within UNEP, mm -hmm. we need to have a greater intake of young people as staff. Um, uh, and we are now starting an intake program precisely to augment that. And we need to ensure that when we publish science, you may not yet be ready for that, but you know, mm. uh, uh, young people who are postdocs or PhDs or others, that they become part of 
the actual authoring so that they get the experience of authoring significant scientific documentation. These are some of the steps that we have com committed to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. I think I would just like to add to that that one of the also results from, from the Stockholm conference was an initiative taken by us as one of the countries uh, on a new ministerial declaration to respond to one of the demands from the youth task force uh, and uh, a common agenda for future generations. And already the first day that we tabled it during the conference, we had 15 countries signing up on it. Uh, and, and one uh, of the points that it's more specific, of course, in the, in the statements itself is to really promote a meaningful participation of young people. And uh, it says specifically in, in delegations, for example. Mm. So there was a large interest, and that's one example of a concrete way to take away the messages from, from Stockholm uh, and to get more countries and governments hopefully behind uh, securing uh, meaningful participation of young people in delegations and in negotiating rooms. So uh, we, we work together. <laughs> mm. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank May you. May I so have? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Thank, thank you, you so much. Can you give these people around us a close? Mm. Thank you so much to all of you for this very inspiring and, and forward-looking conversation. Um, I would now like to give the word to Minister Annika Stanhell, who will announce the Swedish contribution to the 2022 World Environment Day. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, uh, Future Voices, uh, for coming here to share your ideas and concerns with Inger and myself. Uh, we all uh, know another quote from the early 1970s. Uh, we have not inherited this earth from our, from our parents to do with, this, with it as we will. We have borrowed it from our children and we must be careful to use it in their interests as well as our own. I said before that no action is too small to make a difference. But bigger and stronger actors, such as countries or large corporations, have more responsibility, as well as more power to bring about change. This is why Sweden has decided to ban extraction of coal, oil and fossil gas from the 1st of July this year. Creating the green jobs of the future by accelerating the climate transition is one of the top priorities for the Swedish government. As part of our efforts to implement our climate ambitions, we must take actions against activities that are, have neg negative impacts on our health and on our environment. Sweden tries to be at the forefront of the climate transition. And thanks to major green investments and a clear policy direction, only a few days ago, go, for example, we unve unveiled the first vehicle made entirely of fossil-free steel. This shows that the transformation of our societies is an opportunity, not a burden. We can show the world how the ongoing green industrial revolution both reduces emissions and at the same time creates growth and thousands of new jobs for ordinary people. Our message to the global community is clear. The winners in the global race will be the ones that speed up the transition, not the ones that lag behind and cling to a dependency on fossil fuels. This will reduce Swedish emissions and create more green jobs throughout the country, paving a path for other countries to follow by connecting reduced emissions to new green jobs for ordinary people, including youth, is our way of acknowledging that we have borrowed the earth from our children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. As this is my final intervention, I would like to thank uh, Sogoselli, Fernand, Luisa, and Sonia for their valuable contribution. 
um, and addressing some very important issues for the future of our planet, and of course, UNEP Executive Director Inger Anderson. I hope that all of you will go out and do something wonderful for our planet as this is the World Environment Day. If you're unsure of what to do, uh, there is a Swedish, for those of you who are in Sweden, there's a Swedish website with lots of stuff going on in Sweden. If you're not in Sweden, there's a great global website with wonderful activities going on all over the world. Um, they've been put together by teams of amazing people, both at UNEP and at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. But first, we will end this inauguration by enjoying some more music from Sogoselli. Thank you. <laughs>